My name's Mary, and life took a tough turn when I was just ten. My dad had been sick for a while, but I didn't really understand what was going on until he was gone for good. One day he was there, and the next day, there was just an empty seat at the dinner table. It didn't take long for my mom to fill that empty space. Two months later, she brought home Jack. I guess she felt lonely and needed someone fast. Jack moved in like he owned the place, and it was clear he didn't want me around. Mary, this is Jack. Jack, this is my daughter Mary. Mom introduced us the day he moved in. Jack looked at me coldly, like he'd rather be anywhere else. Hi, I managed to say, feeling shy but trying to be polite. Jack just nodded, not even smiling. He turned to mom, Linda, can we talk about the living arrangements? I remember feeling a chill as they walked away, his hand on her shoulder. It didn't take long before I started feeling like an outsider in my own home. Jack had rules for everything and was always on my case. Don't leave your stuff in the living room, eat faster, don't make too much noise, it was non-stop. Mom just went along with whatever Jack said, her eyes looking empty or maybe just tired. One evening at dinner, things boiled over. I accidentally knocked over a glass of water, and it spilled towards Jack. Clumsy kid, can't you do anything right? Jack snapped, jumping up as the water splashed on his pants. Sorry Jack, it was just an accident, I stammered, feeling my face heat up. Sorry doesn't clean up messes, Mary. Be more careful, he scolded, his voice louder than it needed to be. Mom just sat there, quietly dabbing her mouth with a napkin, not saying anything. I looked at her, hoping she would say something, anything, to stand up for me, but she stayed silent. I heard them arguing in their room. Jack's voice was loud and harsh. Linda, that kid of yours needs to shape up. I'm not going to live in chaos just because you're used to it. Mom's reply was soft, but I could catch bits of it. Jack, please, she's just a child, she's still adjusting. Adjusting? It's been months. I'm telling you, if things don't change, I didn't hear the rest, but I didn't need to. The message was clear. Jack wanted me out of the way, and Mom wasn't fighting too hard against it. The next few months were just as hard. Jack's complaints were a daily thing, and Mom's silence grew heavier. I was walking on eggshells, trying not to make a sound, trying to disappear if I could, but you can't disappear in your own home, can you? Even a 10-year-old knows that much. Life at home got more complicated when Mom told us she was expecting. Jack already had a hard time tolerating me, and the news didn't exactly make him happy. He was silent for a long minute before he spoke, and when he did, his words were cold. Well, that's just great, Linda. Just what we needed, he said, his tone dripping with sarcasm. Mom just smiled, but it was a weak smile. It's a blessing, Jack. You'll see a fresh start for us. I felt a mix of excitement and dread. A little brother or sister seemed like a dream, someone new to connect with. But with Jack's mood swings, I wasn't so sure. The months flew by, and the baby finally arrived. It was a girl, and they named her Lauren. I was thrilled. She was so tiny, and when I first saw her, all wrapped up in her pink blanket, my heart melted. I thought having Lauren around might make things better, even make Jack soften up a bit. Holding Lauren felt magical. She was so small, her tiny fingers grasping at nothing. Hey there, Lauren, I'm your big sister, Mary. I'm going to take good care of you, I whispered, promising silently to be there for her no matter what. But the magic didn't last. Bringing Lauren home changed things again. Jack became fussier than ever, especially about money. One night, about a week after Lauren came home, I overheard him talking to mom in the kitchen. His voice was harsh, louder than it needed to be. More expenses, Linda. Diapers, formula, who knows what else. And what about Mary? She's not even mine, and I'm paying for her too. Mom's voice was a quiet murmur. Jack, please, she's just a child. We can manage, things will settle down. It's not just about managing Linda, it's about priorities. We need to think about our family now, our real family. 
I knew what that meant I wasn't real family. The sting of those words hit me hard. I slid down the wall by my door, hugging my knees, trying not to cry. The final straw came when Jack sat us down in the living room one evening. His face was serious, and he avoided looking at me. Linda, we need to think about the future. Mary's getting older, and expenses are piling up. Maybe it's time she went to live with her Aunt Joyce. It felt like a punch in the gut. Being sent away, just like that. Mom finally spoke, looking at me with sad eyes. Mary, honey, it might not be so bad. Aunt Joyce has a nice house, and you'll be well taken care of. But Mom, I don't want to go. I want to stay here with you and Lauren. The room went silent. Jack's next words were cold and final. It's decided then. I'll call Joyce in the morning. Moving in with Aunt Joyce was like stepping into a different world. Her house was big, clean, and always silent, too silent for comfort. The first day I arrived, she laid down her rules like we were negotiating a peace treaty after a long war. You'll follow my rules under my roof, Mary. No nonsense, no mess, no back talk, she declared as she led me through the hall to what would be my room. The room was plain, with bare walls and a single bed in the corner. It felt nothing like home. I nodded, too tired and upset to argue. Homework right after school, chores before dinner, and lights out by eight. I won't tolerate any laziness or sloppiness, you hear? Aunt Joyce continued, her voice firm. Yes, Aunt Joyce, I whispered. Speak up when you're spoken to. Let's have no mumbling here, she snapped. I quickly corrected my tone. Yes, Aunt Joyce, I understand. The days that followed blended into each other, each as strict and unforgiving as the last. Aunt Joyce was tough tougher than anyone I'd ever known. She had a way of making simple conversations feel like interrogations. Homework was a battlefield too. If I got a B instead of an A, Aunt Joyce had sharp words for me. You can do better than this. Your laziness won't fly here, she'd scold even though I'd spent hours poring over books. The worst part was how she reminded me of my mom's decision to send me away. If I dared to talk back or ask for less criticism, she'd retort sharply, no wonder your mom sent you here. You need discipline. You obviously weren't getting it. Those words hurt. They always did. They made me feel unwanted, unloved, like I didn't belong anywhere. I was just another problem mom solved by sending me away. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. I learned to keep my head down, do what I was told, and only speak when necessary. Aunt Joyce had no patience for tears or complaints, and I didn't have the energy left to fight. It's for your own good. She'd often say after scolding me harshly, as if her sharp words were supposed to make me into someone better. I wasn't sure who that better person was supposed to be. All I knew was that I was getting really good at being alone, at being quiet, and at not being a problem. Because in Aunt Joyce's house, not being a problem was the best thing you could be. Living with Aunt Joyce was suffocating, and I found myself missing my mom more each day, even though I knew she had let me go without much of a fight. One afternoon, the feeling of missing her got too strong to ignore. Aunt Joyce was out, probably at her bridge club, and I knew I had at least a couple of hours before she'd be back. Her phone was always left on the kitchen counter, charging next to the fruit bowl. It seemed like my only leak back to my old life. I hesitated for a minute before I picked it up. Dialing my mom's number was like muscle memory I hadn't forgotten it, and maybe I never would. My heart raced as I heard the phone ring once, twice, then I heard her voice. Hello? Mom, it's me, Mary. There was a pause, a breath, maybe. Then, Mary, why are you calling? I swallowed hard, my throat tight. I just wanted to hear your voice. Another pause, longer this time. Then she spoke, cold and hard. You shouldn't have called. But, Mom. Mary, listen to me. You need to stop this. I can't have you calling me. But why? I miss you, Mom. I miss home. When can I come back? Her voice was flat, emotionless, like she was discussing the weather. You can't. That's done. Don't call here anymore. 
I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mom, please. Just don't marry. There's nothing here for you. Goodbye. She hung up and the line went dead. The silence in the kitchen was overwhelming. I felt my handshake as I put the phone back on the charger. The finality in her voice broke something in me. She didn't want me. She really didn't want me anymore. Tears blurred my vision as I stumbled to my room. I closed the door softly, not wanting to make any noise that might hint at my rebellion. I sat on the floor, my back against my bed, and let myself cry. The room felt smaller than ever, like a box slowly closing in on me. I heard the front door open and close, and Aunt Joyce's voice called out, Mary, you better have finished your chores. Yes, Aunt Joyce, I called back, quickly wiping my eyes with the back of my hand. I didn't want her to see any signs of weakness. Weakness wasn't allowed here. I went to the kitchen to help with dinner, acting like nothing had happened, but inside, I felt different emptier, more alone. Mom's final words kept playing over and over in my head. That night, Aunt Joyce found the call log on her phone. Her face twisted into a scowl as she stormed into my room, her voice a harsh whisper that cut through the quiet. So, you took my phone to call your mother. Thought you'd go behind my back. I froze, feeling the blood drain from my face. I just wanted to hear her voice. Aunt Joyce laughed, a harsh, grating sound. And what did that get you, huh? She doesn't want you, Mary. Even you can't deny it now. Her words were like ice, and I felt them chill me to the bone. She grabbed my arm, her grip tight and painful. No more phone, no more pity parties. You're here because she doesn't want you. Remember that. The punishment was severe more chores, stricter rules, and the cold shoulder from Aunt Joyce, who made sure I felt just how unwanted I was every day after that. Aunt Joyce's house had become a prison, each day dragging on heavier than the last. It was clear I was nothing but a burden to her, a nuisance she put up with only because she had to. But even that thin thread of obligation snapped one chilly morning, a year into my stay. You're packing your bags today, Mary, Aunt Joyce announced over breakfast, her voice stern and final. I stared at her, my spoon halfway in my mouth. What? Why? Your mother stopped sending money. No money, no reason to keep you here, she replied bluntly, sipping her coffee as if we were discussing something as trivial as the weather. I felt a cold dread settle in my stomach. So what happens to me now? She shrugged, a cold, dismissive gesture. Not my problem. You can go live with your grandmother. If she won't take you, then it's the orphanage. The thought of going to an orphanage terrified me, but the mention of grandma sparked a tiny flicker of hope. I hadn't seen her since I was little, barely remembered her, but surely she wouldn't turn me away. Packing my bags felt surreal like it was happening to someone else. I was packing up my life at Aunt Joyce's, each item a reminder of the year I'd lost. Aunt Joyce drove me to Grandma's house, and the car ride was silent except for the hum of the engine. When we arrived, the house was smaller and cozier than Aunt Joyce's big, imposing place. Grandma was waiting at the door, her expression unreadable. This is Mary, your granddaughter, Aunt Joyce said, not bothering with any pleasantries. I can't keep her anymore. Linda stopped paying. Grandma looked me over, her eyes sharp but not unkind. I see, come in, Mary. Aunt Joyce didn't stay long. With a brief nod, she left, her duty to me discarded as easily as she had gotten rid of me. Inside, Grandma's house was warm and filled with the scent of cinnamon and something sweet baking. It felt welcoming a stark contrast to Aunt Joyce's cold, sterile environment. You'll be staying in the guest room. I suppose we'll need to sort out some more permanent arrangements, Grandma said as she led me down the hall. The guest room was small, with a window overlooking the garden. It felt safe, a feeling I hadn't associated with a place in a long time. Thank you, Grandma, I said quietly, still unsure of my welcome. She nodded. We're family, Mary. You belong here more than anywhere else. Over the next few weeks, I adjusted to life with Grandma. It was different. She was strict, but there was a kindness to her rules, a gentleness in her reprimands. 
You need to do your chores, Mary. Everyone contributes here, she would remind me, but her tone was patient, not harsh. Yes, Grandma, I would respond, grateful for her fair approach. Living with Grandma, I began to heal. I found comfort in the quiet routine of our days, the peaceful nights, and the steady rhythm of life that was so different from the chaos with Aunt Joyce. The months passed, and on my 19th birthday, Grandma made a decision that would change everything. Over breakfast, she slid an envelope across the table to me. Take a look at this, Mary, she said, her voice carrying a mix of seriousness and warmth. I opened the envelope and pulled out some official-looking papers. What's this? It's adoption papers, Mary. I want to adopt you. Make things official so no one can ever make you feel unwanted again, she explained, watching me closely for my reaction. I felt a lump in my throat. Really, Grandma? You mean it? Yes, I do. You're not just staying here, Mary. You're my family, and it's time we made that clear to everyone else, too. Two weeks later, it was done. We went to court and I officially became Mary Bennett, with a new sense of belonging that I had longed for since mom sent me away. With grandma's support, I finally felt like I was home. I began looking forward to the future, and grandma encouraged me to focus on my studies, especially science, which had always fascinated me. You've got a sharp mind for it, Mary. You could go into medicine. How would you like that? she suggested one day as we were going over some of my school projects. I'd love that, Grandma. I want to help people, I replied, the idea starting to take root. Then it's settled. We'll get you into a good college program. I'll support you every step of the way, she declared with determination. True to her word, Grandma was there for me throughout my high school years. She tutored me in math and science using her old-school methods that were strict but effective. You need to understand the basics, Mary. You can't skip the foundation. She'd insist whenever I struggled with complex problems. I graduated with top marks, thanks to her unwavering support. Grandma then helped me navigate the daunting college application process. When I got accepted into a medical college with a partial scholarship, she was as proud as if she'd received the acceptance herself. We'll manage the finances. Don't you worry about that, Grandma said when I fretted over the costs. You focus on your studies and become the best doctor you can be. Medical school was tough but fulfilling. I was drawn to oncology, the branch of medicine that deals with cancer. It was hard, both emotionally and intellectually but it felt right like I was exactly where I needed to be. I completed my degree, then my internship, and finally my residency, each step a milestone that Grandma celebrated. You're making a real difference, Mary. I'm so proud of you, she'd say, her eyes shiny with pride. By the time I turned 35, I was fully established in my career as an oncologist. My life was busy but fulfilling, filled with long hours at the hospital and the satisfaction of knowing I was making a difference. Through it all, Grandma was my anchor, always there to listen and offer advice on tough days. But life, as it often does, threw another curveball my way. Grandma's health, which had been declining, took a sudden turn for the worse. It was swift and unexpected, the kind of decline that leaves you scrambling to catch your breath. I remember coming home one evening tired after a particularly tough day at the hospital. Grandma was sitting in her favorite armchair, looking out the window. Her voice was weaker when she called me over. Mary, come sit with me for a bit, she said, patting the chair next to her. I sat down and took her hand in mine. It felt fragile, like it could break with too much pressure. I'm not going to beat around the bush, she started, her tone serious. The doctors say there's not much time left. We need to talk about practical things. A lump formed in my throat, and my eyes filled with tears. Grandma, please. She squeezed my hand, her grip still strong. No tears now, Mary. We've got things to sort out. You need to be ready. The next few weeks were a blur of doctor's visits, late nights, and legal paperwork. Grandma wanted to make sure everything was in order for me, 
that there would be no complications with her estate or her wishes. When the end came, it was peaceful. Grandma passed away in her sleep at home, just as she had wanted. The emptiness left by her passing was overwhelming, and the silence in the house felt too heavy to bear at times. Planning the funeral was hard. I went through her address book, calling relatives and friends. The responses were polite, some even warm, but it became clear that not many would make the effort to come. My heart ached, not just for the loss of grandma, but for the loneliness of this farewell. The funeral day was quiet, the chapel more empty than full. I stood there, feeling oddly detached as the priest spoke about life, loss, and legacy. It didn't take long after the funeral for the past. I thought I had left behind to come knocking at my door. My mother, stepfather, and their daughter, who is now 21 years old, showed up unexpectedly. My mother didn't waste any time. Mary, you need to share the inheritance your grandmother left you, she demanded, her tone entitled. I stared at them, disbelief mixing with anger. You left me, remember? Twenty-first years ago, you decided I was too much of a burden. My mother's face twisted into a sneer, ungrateful girl. Now you're a rich doctor with an inheritance. You owe us. I laughed, the sound bitter. Grandma adopted me legally. You are nothing to me now. The shock on her face was almost comical. My stepfather, ever the bully, leaned in. You're going to regret this, Mary. As they left, I slammed the door behind them, the click of the lock sounding unusually satisfying. Standing there, my back against the door, I felt a mix of relief and renewed determination. A few days after their visit, I was at work when I got a call from a neighbor. Mary, it looks like your family's at your house again. They've been bringing in furniture. It looks like they're moving in or something. When I pulled into the driveway, seeing their car parked out front made my stomach turn. I walked in to find my mother, stepfather, and stepsister unpacking boxes in the living room, acting like they owned the place. What are you doing? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. My mother turned around, feigning surprise. Oh, Mary, we're just settling in. After all, this is family property. No, it's not. This is my house, legally left to me by grandma. You need to leave now. My stepfather stepped forward with a smirk on his face. Make us, we're family, and we deserve a part of this house. I could feel the anger rising inside me. You haven't been family for over 21st years. You can't just come here and claim what's mine. My stepsister, who had been watching from the side, finally spoke up. Come on, Mary, don't be so heartless. We're just asking for what's fair. Fair? I laughed, the sound sharp and bitter. What's fair about abandoning a child? What's fair about only showing up when you think there's money to be had? They had no answers, just scowls and muttered curses. I'm calling the police, I declared, pulling out my phone. My mother tried to stop me. You'll regret this, Mary. I've regretted knowing you for years. This is nothing new. I shot back as I dialed 533. The police arrived quickly. I explained the situation, showing them the legal documents proving my ownership of the house and grandma's will. The officers were firm. You need to leave, one of them told my mother and stepfather. This property doesn't belong to you and if you don't comply, you'll be removed forcibly. My stepfather glared at me, his anger clear, but there was nothing he could do. This isn't over Mary, he threatened as they gathered their things. Oh, but it is, I replied, my tongue cold and final. After they were gone, I walked through the house through grandma's house. Each room was filled with memories, each corner a testament to her love and the life she had built here a life she had fought to pass on to me. Standing in her favorite spot by the window, I made a promise, not just to her but to myself. I would not let the bitterness of the past tarnish my future. I had fought hard to become who I was, and I would continue to fight to honor her legacy and the sacrifices she had made for me. At a family gathering, my stepmother threw coffee on my dad's face as soon as I mentioned my father's job at the factory. She laughed uncontrollably while doing it. 
My stepfather watched without saying a word. The coffee stain spread across the suit my dad had cleaned just for this day. Thankfully, the coffee was only lukewarm, so there was no risk of burns. I was shocked but quickly handed a napkin to my dad. Henry, my boyfriend, was panicking as he tried to clean my dad's suit. He couldn't stop himself from laughing at his parents' ridiculous behavior. During this chaos, my dad just stood up, pointed at them, and sternly said he would ruin their company. This was a tone I had never heard him use before. He took my hand, and we started to leave the Hamilton Hill household. Henry scolded his parents and hurried after us, apologizing. He promised his parents would say sorry later, but my dad dismissed it, saying we were done with them. My name is Olivia Wilde, a 29-year-old office worker. My dad raised me alone after my mom died when I was little. He ran the factory and always made time for my school events, often rushing back to work afterward. I admired him immensely for that dedication. In college, I dated Henry, who was four years older than me. He was a gentle, sincere, and polite guy, well-liked at school. He accepted my feelings, and we started dating. Although he hinted at issues with his parents, he never went into details, and I didn't press him. Henry had been living on his own since college, though he visited his parents occasionally and always seemed worn out afterward. When Henry first met my dad, despite his family troubles, he always prioritized me and that made me proud of him. I was eager to see how my dad and Henry would get along, so I planned to introduce them. It was a mix of nervousness and excitement when we unexpectedly ran into my dad during a date. Oh dad, aren't you supposed to be at work today? What's going on? I asked. Ah, Olivia, is that you? I'm just coming back from a client meeting. And who is this? He replied. This is Henry Hamilton Hill. We're dating, I said. My dad has a serious look that can be intimidating, but he isn't really stern. Henry was quite nervous when he met my dad for the first time. He bowed deeply and said, Nice to meet you. I'm Henry Hamilton Hill. I'm honored to be dating Olivia. My dad smiled warmly at Henry's respectful greeting and started chatting with him. So you're Olivia's boyfriend? Don't be so nervous. Take good care of her, okay? Yes, I'll do my best, thank you, Henry replied. As they continued talking, Henry became more relaxed and they seemed to get along well. I was relieved to see the three important men in my life connecting. I had worried about whether my dad would like Henry. We couldn't stay long since my dad had to return to work, so after saying goodbye, I turned to Henry, who seemed a bit dazed. I asked if something was wrong, and he suddenly got excited. That was really your dad, right? He asked, which puzzled me. Yes, that's my dad. Why? What's up? I replied. Henry just crossed his arms and seemed lost in thought. Curious, I asked him what he was thinking about so intensely. It's nothing big, just wondering, he said vaguely, which left me feeling uneasy. He dodged any more questions about it. Although he said he liked my dad, I started to worry whether he really did. This concern stayed with me until a few days later when Henry called me for an important talk. Nervous about our last meeting with my dad, I went to the cafe where we planned to meet. Seeing Henry's gloomy face through the glass as I walked in only deepened my anxiety, but I decided to stay cheerful as I greeted him. I slowly walked over to Henry, who was deeply sighing. I gently tapped him on the shoulder, surprising him. Whoa, Olivia, you scared me, he exclaimed, holding his chest and widening his eyes as he saw me. I was taken aback by how jumpy he was. He seemed really troubled. Sitting across from Henry, who still looked gloomy, I ordered from the waiter. My anxiety increased as his expression stayed down. I really wanted him to share what was on his mind, so I spoke up. Hey, Henry, what's bothering you so much? Is there something wrong with my dad? I asked. Henry quickly looked up and immediately shook his head. Absolutely not. I actually respect your dad. It's just my... My... He trailed off and looked down again. I sighed, feeling like I needed to pull the words out of him. If you're worried about something, I want to know. 
What's on your mind? I urged him. Henry took a deep breath, as if deciding to open up, and then began to talk. There's something I need to tell you about my parents. It's a bit of a long story, but I need you to hear it all, he said. The story Henry shared was quite shocking. He told me that his parents are very judgmental, always looking at people's education and jobs. They've been very controlling in his life, even going as far as to rudely dismiss any girlfriend he introduced right away, which always ended with the girls breaking up with him in tears. That's why Henry was hesitant about our relationship, especially about introducing me to his parents. But I reassured him, don't worry, we don't need to involve your parents much in our marriage. We can just handle the wedding formalities and that's it. My dad seems to like you, so what's the problem? It's okay, my dad liked you, so there's nothing to worry about. Really? That makes me happy, Henry responded, a smile breaking through his worries. When I first met your dad, I was surprised by how different he is from my own parents. I thought about how marrying Olivia would make me the son of such a great man, but it also means my parents become your parents, and I wasn't sure about that. I perked up when you said your dad liked me, but then I sighed deeply again. However, I had an idea and looked up, apologizing. When we go meet my parents for our marriage, can we have your dad come too? I want them to see that there are respectable people like him. It might not change them right away, but I hope it helps. Okay, I'll talk to my dad about it, but I wish you had approached this differently, I said. Oh, sorry, I'll do it properly from now, Henry replied, suddenly realizing he should have proposed in a more traditional way. After receiving Henry's proposal, I decided to talk to my father about joining us when meeting Henry's parents. Initially hesitant, my dad agreed when Henry formally asked for my hand in marriage. We then set a date to meet his parents. On the day, dressed up and standing at Henry's family home's front door, I was understandably nervous after hearing all the stories. My dad tried to lighten the mood, laughing and encouraging us, no need to be so tense. Henry's parents are just overly concerned. Be confident. His reassurance helped calm my nerves a bit. At the door, Henry rang the bell, but there was no sound. Wondering if they weren't home, he rang again with no answer. Not wanting to make a bad impression in front of my dad, Henry excused himself and went inside first. My father and I exchanged worried glances and waited quietly. Soon, Henry came out looking flustered. Before I could ask what was wrong, he put on a forced smile and said, Sorry for the delay. Please wait a bit longer, we'll be ready soon. Then he went back inside. My dad sighed in exasperation, and I felt increasingly anxious. This incident could even jeopardize our wedding plans. My father isn't short-tempered, but he really dislikes dishonesty. I was worried about the worst-case scenario as we waited outside. Finally, Henry came out and awkwardly invited us inside. His parents were waiting for us, but they seemed odd. His mother had a slight grin, and his father looked away, uninterested. We were led to the living room, where the coffee served was hastily made and lukewarm. The whole situation made me uneasy, but I decided to continue with the introductions. Henry, trying to regain his composure, introduced my dad and me. Although Henry's introduction was warm and thoughtful, his parents sneered at us. Suddenly, his mother grabbed a coffee cup, and as soon as she spoke about calling off the engagement, she splashed coffee on my dad. My father-in-law, who was smiling and giggling next to her, didn't scold her. The coffee stain quickly spread on the suit my dad had cleaned for the day. Luckily, the coffee was lukewarm, so there was no risk of burns. Shocked. I handed my dad a handkerchief while Henry frantically tried to wipe off the suit, worried about any potential injuries. Henry's parents just laughed in response. My dad, however, remained calm. He stood up, pointed at them, and declared he would ruin their company. He spoke in a tone I had never heard before, took my hand, and we left the Hamilton Hill house. Henry scolded his parents and then quickly followed us. I'm really sorry. I'll have my parents apologize later, 
Henry said to my dad, who gravely replied, no need. We're done with them anyway, as he patted Henry on the shoulder. We went back to our house, and my dad immediately changed his clothes. Meanwhile, Henry was earnestly apologizing outside my dad's room. I could hear my dad's troubled voice occasionally, but I was too shocked by Henry's parents' behavior to pay much attention. I knew getting along with Henry's parents would be tough, but I never expected them to act so rudely. Furious at how they insulted my dad, I sat on the living room sofa, clenching my fists and replaying the event in my mind. It wasn't helping, but I couldn't stop myself. When my dad finished changing, he and Henry came into the living room. Henry immediately started apologizing to me, almost bowing. Olivia, I'm really sorry. I never expected them to do such a thing, especially to insult your dad. I'm truly sorry. What happened was terrible, Henry said. He was sincere and didn't even ask for forgiveness, showing he knew it wasn't easily forgivable. Seeing his earnest apology, I realized I had to apologize too. I took Henry's hand as he knelt and said, I'm sorry too. I should not have suggested meeting without knowing everything. I didn't expect things to turn out this way. Then, I turned to my dad and apologized from the bot Henry of my heart. Dad, I'm sorry this happened because of my thoughtless suggestion. My dad just looked down, troubled, and shrugged his shoulders. It was hard for him to say anything. None of us expected this to happen, but that meant my dad's threat was serious. I decided to ask him about it. Dad, was what you said true? Are you really going to ruin their company? I asked. My dad glanced at Henry, then nodded firmly. Yes, it's true. I'm going to ruin their company. Their business was already struggling, so I've been thinking about what to do. This seems like a good opportunity to cut ties, my dad stated, his eyes showing unwavering determination. He runs an industrial company and is the CEO. His company is a top local enterprise where he serves as both the factory manager and CEO. He started as a worker in this factory and gave up his dream of becoming a painter to raise me alone after my mom passed away. He worked tirelessly, and his hard work led to several promotions. Eventually, he caught the attention of the former CEO, who chose my dad as his successor when he retired. The company has expanded, owning various subsidiaries, one of which is managed by Henry's father, my father-in-law. We discovered this during our recent visit. Ideally, my father-in-law should have realized this, but he didn't, due to the premature actions of Henry's mother. Henry just wanted to explain that his father worked for a subsidiary of my dad's company. However, his parents' prejudices prevented this from being clarified, leading to the current situation. If only his parents had listened. My father mentioned that his company was having some management problems, and he was thinking about what to do next. He mentioned layoffs might improve things, but he really wanted to avoid that. It's a good chance to decide which parts to downsize, he said with a troubled smile, clearly not wanting to fire any workers. You could tell he regretted even considering it. After a serious talk with my dad, Henry spoke to him quietly. I've decided to close it down, but that means your parents will be in trouble. It's harsh, but are you okay with that? Henry hesitated at first, then looked firmly at my father and replied, I've already cut ties with them. They did something unforgivable. Part of their consequence is dealing with their actions. More than that, I want them to think about what they've done, including this incident. But I have a request. I know it's awkward to ask now, but please, let me get engaged to Olivia. I know I've caused trouble because of my parents, but I want to be with her more than anything. Please forgive me. Moved by Henry's sincerity and despite the situation, I'd also pleaded with my dad. Please, dad, I know how things have turned out, but I want to be with Henry. After listening to us, my dad thought for a while, then seemed to resign himself. If you both feel the same, it's fine, but there's one condition. Your parents are company executives. I need to know what you plan to do with their employees. If you can't handle that, the marriage is off, he said and then sent Henry away, 
not even looking at me before he went back to his room. A few days later, Henry prepared a plan for the employees at his father's company. He arranged a meeting with my dad, and when I got home from work, they were discussing it. Henry had written down possible job placements for all the employees and was showing it to my dad, hoping he could employ them at his company. Henry expressed his desire to help with the transition and add energy to the business. I also selfishly want to work at your company. I'll work for free until everything is stable and we see results. I want to make up for any problems with my hard work, Henry said, bowing to my father. He seemed to feel partly responsible for his own company's problems and was determined to work hard to help resolve the situation. I just learned our marriage would be delayed, but it was a necessary delay. Welcome back, Olivia. I'm sorry for making such a big decision alone, but it wouldn't be fair if I were the only one happy, Henry explained. You're too selfish. Dad, please let me work at the company with Henry. I'll also work for free, and I want you to accept Henry's proposal, I said, despite Henry trying to stop me. I insisted firmly and begged my dad. While this was happening, my dad didn't say anything, but after repeated pleas, he uncrossed his arms and quietly nodded. Meanwhile, Henry's parents still hadn't apologized. My dad seemed to have been waiting for their apology for the past few days, but that time was up. Time's up, he muttered, starting to prepare to take over my father-in-law's company. Time passed, and the day came when the company collapsed. Henry's parents contacted us in protest, summoning us to their home. When we arrived, the place was crowded with people protesting the closure. They were all former employees, angry and shouting. It seemed Henry's father hadn't explained anything to them. By summoning us, it looked like his parents intended to blame us for their failure. As soon as they saw us, they pointed at us and started accusing. Look there, that's the root of all evil. It's not me, they're the ones who ruined the company, not me. Especially that woman, she seduced our son and ingratiated herself with her father. We are victims too, so stop complaining about it, they shouted. Others also criticized my father and me, trying to deflect attention from themselves. Despite the parents' wild accusations, Henry, visibly upset, tried to calm the former employees. Please wait, everyone. Yes, my father's company collapsed, but it's because of those three also. I want to help all of you who lost your jobs unfairly. Please listen to me. As Henry spoke, the chaos slowly calmed down and the former employees turned their attention to us. Henry called out each person's name, announcing their new job placements. Realizing they were not forgotten, the employees let out sighs of relief. After Henry announced everyone's placement, his parents started making a scene. Hey, Henry, what about us? Why are you ignoring us? We're victims too. Tell us our job placements. If you do, we might even forgive that man and allow your marriage to that woman, they complained. Ignoring his parents' outbursts, Henry began explaining how the company went bankrupt, a situation his own parents had caused. I apologize for the inconvenience caused to all of you but thanks to a kind-hearted CEO, your jobs are secure. Please calm down and let's start fresh, Henry said. After addressing the employees, he turned to my father and bowed deeply. I really apologize for the inconvenience and thank you for considering my request. I will work with all my heart. The former employees, seeing Henry's respect, also showed their gratitude towards my father. Meanwhile, his parents were the only ones objecting. Don't be fooled. That man ruined the company and that woman encouraged him. Wake up to reality. You're struggling for jobs because the company was destroyed, right? Just because you're getting help doesn't mean you should forget the truth. Despite his parents' desperate pleas, everyone had already heard the truth from Henry. They completely ignored his parents. Even my father disregarded their complaints. When the former employees looked to him for reassurance, he promised to share more details later, and they left, relieved and thanking my father. After everyone had gone and it was quiet, his parents started fussing about their future. 
We're losing this house we used as collateral. We're going to be homeless. What are we supposed to do now? Henry sighed in exasperation at his parents who still tried to blame us. I had enough and finally said, I don't care what you think. You got what you deserved, and it can't be helped. Why don't you show some remorse? I scolded them, but they didn't seem to listen. Unable to bear their persistence any longer, I lost my patience. Haven't you just caused trouble for Henry all this time? Boasting about being business owners and only caring about titles? Isn't that why all this happened? Upon hearing my words, his parents looked like they were ready to argue back, implying that I was being rude. But then my father stepped in firmly, indicating he wouldn't let them speak further. A business owner is supposed to take responsibility. You should at least complete your final task properly, he said. Left speechless by our collective scolding, his parents could say nothing more. We left them behind and walked away. Eventually, his parents lost everything the company, the house, the land. They never provided any guarantees to the former employees and avoided taking responsibility. After losing everything, they were caught for deceit and dashing. When Henry's parents reached out to him for help, Henry, having cut ties with them, coldly turned them away. They're probably in jail now. We've heard nothing from them since. Even if they get out, they still owe debts to the former employees, so their situation hasn't changed. Afterward, Henry and I quit our jobs and joined my father's company. We lived off our savings in the first month, working for free as promised. One day at work, we met a former employee from his parents' company. This person rushed over to us, eager to shake our hands and express their gratitude to my father for giving them a job, to Henry for arranging it, and surprisingly to me. I didn't remember, but apparently, I had helped that person with some materials soon after they joined the company. After expressing immense gratitude and a desire to keep working hard, the former employee left. Feeling somewhat redeemed by his words, we hurried to my father's office. He welcomed us warmly and pulled out several thick envelopes from his desk drawer, handing them to us. What's this, Dad? I asked. It's your salaries for the past months. It ended up being multiple envelopes because it couldn't all fit into one, he said with a laugh. We were stunned. It hadn't been many months, and with all the new employees hired, it seemed impossible for us to have earned this much. Yet here he was, giving us our salaries. We were taken aback and couldn't quite believe it, but my father continued, your hard work revitalized the team. They constantly expressed their gratitude and concern for you. I couldn't leave such excellent employees unpaid, especially since our performance had improved so much. Hearing this, we hugged each other and cried. We had been so focused on our tasks that we hadn't realized the impact we had made. But even more than that, we were touched by the concern shown for us. Then my father added something even more wonderful. Henry, I'm impressed with your leadership. If you're okay with it, would you marry my daughter? Yes, yes, of course, I'm honored and grateful, Henry replied tearfully, bowing to me and my father. I hugged Henry, crying alongside him. And so, we got married. We continued working at my father's company, living happily every day. Gradually, we became more skilled at our jobs, contributing even more effectively. This allowed us to discuss production efficiency and new ideas with my father. Henry was also busy visiting the factories and subsidiaries to ensure everything ran smoothly. He was constantly proposing solutions and suggesting the implementation of new systems. We were more passionate about our work than ever before, finding true fulfillment in our work. However, our time at the company was about to take a brief pause. I was about to go on maternity leave. My father, Henry, our colleagues, and I were all looking forward to the arrival of our child.